Thank you for the kind introduction. And first off, the conflict of interest, as Dr. Carlos mentioned, I'm just starting my neurology residency, so not in infectious disease. I don't have any conflict of interest right now. And this will be the overview of what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, you, you may notice that today's topic overall for this symposium is going to be ART. And you can see that I cheat a little bit. That I cannot use this word, the term ART, because this is a very new topic and not a lot of data. So I, I would rather go with the broader term of ARV, meaning that the enteroretroviral agents to be used as both PrEP and also as the treatment options. And furthermore, the sex hormones that I'm going to talk about today will only based on um, what we as a team in the prevention team, TRC, ARC Center, has been involved in heavily last year. And that term is Gender Affirmative Hormone Therapy, or GAHT. Uh, GAHT can then be further categorized into feminizing hormone therapy, or FHT, uh, used among transgender women, and masculinizing hormone therapy, or MHT, used among transgender men. So today is going to talk about gender affirmative hormone therapy, interactions towards or um, back and forth with the ARV. First, I just want to uh, kind of give you an, a little bit of background of what the GAHT is. And first, first thing first, we need to understand why is GAHT being used? And the term for that is gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is uh, uh, discomfort or distress that it, ca it, it is caused by a discrepancy between a person's gender identity and that person's sex assigned at birth. And this also includes the associated gender role, um, some discrepancy between the primary and secondary sex characteristics. There are guidelines mentioning management options for this gender dysphoria. And roughly, there are number one, changes in gender expression and role. Number two, the GAHT that we are going to talk about a lot today. Number three, psychotherapy. And last but not least, surgery. Uh, to be more precise, it's, uh, it's called sex reassignment surgery, or SRS for short. Now the goal for gender affirmative hormone therapy, I think is quite easily understandable. So the goal is twofold. Number one, increase the secondary sex characteristic of the desired sex. And number two is to reduce or suppress, um, I would say the innate secondary sex characteristic. So number one, F uh, FHT, feminizing hormone therapy, used among transgender women. There are a lot, and I need to emphasize on this, there are so many regimens that can be considered as feminizing hormone therapy. And you will see later on during my presentation of why this would be a little bit of problematic. Regardless of so many regimens considered as feminizing hormone therapy, most or almost all of them would require estrogen. And the reason to that is because estrogen stimulates female secondary sex characteristics very well. Uh, in some way, it can partially reduce some of the male secondary sex characteristics, but more often than not, it, it is usually not enough for a uh, transgender population. So they often seek this thing called anti-androgen in addition to the estrogen therapy to further suppress the male secondary sex characteristics. And again, uh, there are so many regimens that can be considered as feminizing hormone therapy. These are just a few of them. But all, all of these are the recommendation um, based on our Tangerine Clinic's uh, recommendation for feminizing hormone therapy. I think right off the bat, you can um, notice that there are a lot of form of estrogen, a lot of routes to be taken, per oral, um, transdermal, by patches, by gel, and a lot of doses ranges. For entry endogen, we have things uh, called cyproterone acetate, or CPA for short. And this is a pill entry androgen, non-steroidal non anti-androgen. Uh, in, in Thailand, this is among the most commonly used anti-androgen. Spironolactone is more commonly used in the US, and other things like finasteride and medroxyprogesterone. The most important thing here to be noticed is that the doses range very widely. And I think it's kind of like, uh, convey the message that uh, these populations should be receiving the meds under professional care because each specific doses are for specific, I would say, level of each person's secondary sex characteristic at that point of time. So it can be changeable. Next is the masculine hormones therapy, again with the same concept. 
Um, but for masculinity hormone therapy, the drug will, will almost always be testosterone, which is used to stimulate male secondary sex characteristics, um, used among transgender men. Again, uh, well, a little bit um, less option than estrogen, but we still notice several forms of testosterone and its derivation. One interesting point here regarding masculinity hormone therapy of testosterone is that we don't recommend oral testosterone. Uh, and the reason to that is because oral testosterone or its equivalents are less effective compared to the intramuscular uh, route or even transdermal. Again, you can notice the wide range of doses here. So that's pretty much it for the GAHT, categorized to feminizing hormone therapy and masculinizing hormone therapy. Uh, reminding us again that ARV here can be categorized into two groups, uh, the PrEP arm and the uh, ART, uh, the whole package for the treatment arm. And I think this is very important due to the fact that uh, the drug interaction, the, pharmaco um, the pharmacokinetics, the physiology of drug interaction plays an, a very unique role, whether you use NRTI or in NRTI or PI. So that leads me to talk about the current hypothesis regarding the drug, drug interaction between GAHT and ARV. Uh, this is a very beautifully made illustration from Anderson and his team published it in JS three years ago, and it shows the pharmacology continuum uh, for the TDF FTC based PrEP. And I'm going to walk you through each step is that when you take PrEP, you would want PrEP to get absorbed from your GI tract into the blood circulation. When this requires like good adherences, absorption, distribution, transporter, etc. Once the, the drug reaches the, your blood concentration, the blood circulation, excuse me, you would expect that the drug would reach the target tissue. And once it reaches your target tissue, you now need enzymes to make sure that it can get into intracellular and turn itself from the substrate form into its active form before we can hope for the antiviral effect. Just from this figure alone, the current uh, hypothesis for drug inhibition uh, can only be found in two, of group, two groups of, of the figure, and one is transporter, number two is enzymes. Talking about the transporters, which is one of the hypotheses, um, there's a study suggesting that uh, these transporters express themselves differently between each organs. And the, the study that have been conducted compared the rectal tissue to the female genital tissue. So I think this is kind of the first glimpse that raised the possibilities that hormones may play a, a role in distributing these transporters. And although Currently, there was no major transporter involvement has been reported for estradiol disposition. Focusing on the table one, you can see this transporter called MRP2, which is, let me see if I can put my mouth into MRP2, which is one of the TDF transporter. It actually involved in estradiol clearances. To throw out some name again, a BR, BCRP is another TDF transporter which has been reported that it, it, it is actually inhibited by estradiol. So there's a possibility. The reason I, I use the word possibly is that we cannot confirm it for sure. I mean, we, we've seen some link between it, but to interpret the clinical relevance of transporter might be a little bit tough because these transporter may have overlapping activities, may distribute themselves very differently, and last but not least, uh, the process involving you in pharmacokinetics, some of the transporters are uh, involved in multi-steps. So very hard to, to interpret the results. Next, I'm talking about the enzyme, and the enzyme I'm talking about is a 5 prime nucleotidase. A very simple illustration showing that nucleotide, for this case, they put in off of here, would need to be um, activated by the nucleotide kinase before it changes itself into its active form. In this case, it's enophobia diphosphate. Five prime nucleotides inhibit this process. Unfortunately for us, estrogen actually induces or stimulates this five prime nucleotides. Hence, estrogen has the possibilities to reduce the active form 
of nucleotide. So the, 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 these two mechanisms, I would say, were based on NRTI, uh, which, would be a prob which would be a problem for PrEP. But how about ART when you add an NRTI, when you add PI to the regimen? The problem becomes much more because now you're going to see this thing called CYP450. And this involved in drug interaction, not just in the HIV field, not just in the hormonal field, but many, many meds. Unfortunate thing is that E2 is predominantly metabolized through the CYP450. And we already know now that NNRTI is a potent CYP450 inducer, and a boosted PI, meaning having the return of vehicle visits, that is a potent CYP450 inhibitor. Again, very, I would say very reasonable hypothesis here, but the, the proven result is not there yet for us. So I think that's all for each part of it, the hormonal part, the drug interaction part, and the ARV. Now I'm going to split a little bit uh, into two groups. Number one, I'm going to talk about transgender women and the interaction between feminizing hormone therapy um, and ARV. So just a brief background uh, regarding transgender women. Um, this population are at elevated risk for HIV infection. The number is 19.1, which is the HIV prevalence among transgender women. Of course, this is the overall prevalence. Um, it's highs and lows uh, between each region. In the US, for example, it's 20%. Vietnam, a close neighbor, around 6%. And in Thailand, it's around 12%. And then the number, 49. Uh, transgender women are 49 times more likely to be HIV infected than the general population. And the reason to is is because of a lot of risk factors. This is only just some of it. By all behavioral, such as engaging in unprotected receptive anal intercourse and also their sexual network. Psychological aspect, depression can lead to many self-harm activities. And I think among the most important one is social discrimination. And sometimes it looks like a vicious cycle. You have lower education that leads to poverty. Poverty can lead to uh, being sex worker. And another thing to make matter worse is the barriers to health care. Um, for example, um, some part of the fall is, is in our part in the health care professional as well. We don't know a lot regarding transgender women. And there has been a report that uh, many transgender women become stigmatized to come to the hospital because of the way um, the hospital staff um, treated them. Uh, last but not least, they were left out from many researchers. So talking about researchers, and I'm just going to talk about PrEP first. The IPREC study, um, as Dr. Don mentioned, is among the first, it's the first major study to show us the efficacy of PrEP. And what we learned from PrEP is that adherence is count. And well, I think it's kind of like common sense. If you don't take it, you cannot expect it to work. And we can see that the efficacy increased with the study that have great adherences. I brought this slide from one of my mentors, Professor Kiat Rak Lung Tham. And I think he summarized uh, this very well, summarizing the major PrEP studies and the efficacy among high adherence individuals. So you can see here, very good numbers, wonderful. A lot of uh, great efficacy from these great adherences study. But what I notice here is, is the main population in this study. You can see it right here, hypergay MSM, proud MSM again. IPREX have some transgender women, but again, majority of them is MSM. Partners prep is heterosexual people. So, the significant transgender participant is, is left out. Um, and this occurred since the beginning, since the IPREC study. Um, but, but fortunately, I think, I think this gave us the glimpse that, okay, we know it now that uh, we need to have some more data regarding um, the transgender population. And fortunately, Dr. Deutsch from the uh, Transgender Excellence Center in UCSF did a subgroup analysis of the IPREC trial published in Lancet a couple of years back. And it shows here that from the IPREC study, a total of 2,500 participants, roughly 340 were transgender women. So that's around 14%. I think straight away we can see that uh, there are very unique uh, vocabulary, unique word in order for us to um, really include all the transgender women, um, 29 identifying themselves as women, 
296, and they find themselves as trans and 14, even in the final as men, but they were using feminizing hormone therapies. And the main outcome of this analysis is that PrEP was not effective for HIV prevention among transgender women. So not a very good, well, it's negative, not very good outcome for us. But when we look deeper into it, there's some lights here. 11 transgender women in the PrEP arm who zero converted all of them had none of the PrEP level in their blood. And when we look a little bit deeper, um, no infections were observed among transgender women who used equal to more than four tablets per week. Of course, this is indicated by the drug concentration in their blood. So th there's some lights to it that, okay, maybe there can be some um, protective effect from PrEP regarding this group. Um, I just want to show again from the same study that even though the number of transgender women participants is only, was only 67 participants, there were over 100 regimens here, showing us that there are so many regimens out there um, that people are using right now for a feminizing hormone therapy. And last but not least, for the same study, um, they divided group of transgender women who used feminizing hormone therapy versus those who did not. And the result was that transgender women who used feminizing hormone therapy were less likely than those who did not to have any detectable drug concentration and also any protective drug concentrations. And I think this leads to two possibilities. One is that transgender women who, all, who were on Feminizing hormone therapy really did have poor adherences, and I think this is a very simple um, explanation. Number two is that transgender women who were on feminizing hormone therapy were actually having great adherences, but there might be drug interaction that reduced the efficacy of PrEP, perhaps from the hormones. Now, either choice one or choice two. I would say that all of these are correlated to the, the topic of drug-drug interaction. And that is because a survey has suggesting that many of them have suggested that the reason for poor adherences is because people are concerned over the drug interaction between these two medications. And that's quite sad because actually transgender women population have high acceptability, up to 80% are willing to take PrEP. And I look at the high concerns as a good thing because that, me that means that people are really looking into it. And the concerns are this. Number one, side effects. Number two, difficulty taking pills. And number three, stigma. Number one, number two, and number three is not very unique to transgender population. I mean, it, it, it can apply to, to all genders or the general population as well. But number four, exclusion of transgender women in advertising. Uh, this is very eye-opening for me. I, I thought back to myself and, oh yeah, I agree with them. I mean, we, we often see like MSM or heterosexual with the cover of uh, PrEP advertisement. And last but not least, lack of research. One of the qualitative surveys uh, beautifully put, and I quote, you can't expect someone to be full on your PrEP, prep wagon if you well, haven't researched it. And that's very understandable. So that leaves the transgender woman, well, at least before 2018, that they, they were left in this unknown territory. I mean, you, you don't know whether it's going to have any effect towards each other. So human nature, we need to choose one because we cannot do both. We are concerned about it. And unsurprisingly, they choose feminizing hormone therapy because well, PrEP is well, primary prevention. Not, well, a lot of people don't care about that. So people have, may have poor adherence to PrEP. And again, this, is, this, may, this might apply to ART as well. So this is a very dangerous thing. Now I'm going to take you back a little bit, talking about um, what was the previous studies regarding these uh, sex hormones and PrEP. Before 2018, all the studies were done in the context of contraceptive method. So the clinical outcome, the most important thing is pregnancy. And I show here two of the studies, um, both of them conducted in Africa. 2014 and 15, respectively. The results is very clear that PrEP does not affect the efficacy in contraceptive of either OCP, injectable, the MPA, or implants. So I mean, that's a good thing, but these are cisgender women um, population, and 
they are concerned that we cannot apply to transgender women because the hormone we use to model transgender women can sometimes be higher than what we use for contraceptives. Another outcome is a pharmacokinetics outcome. And two studies have shown that uh, TDF FTC was not associated with the changes in levonorgestrel levels, and this is from the implantation. And uh, the other, another one shows us that TDF was not associated with the changes in the E2 levels. So that leads me to um, the most important thing, or actually the thing that uh, the conference organizer asked me to talk to you all today, and that is the current data of all these GAHG drug interactions towards ARV, but, but to be precise, it's only PrEP right now. We don't have the data for ART. I have three studies to show you. All of these three studies was presented just last year in, the, in 2018. So these, these are very new data. The first study is from Dr. Cottrell and her team at UNC. And the objective of this study is to assess intracellular pharmacology at the HGB transmitted sites. So uh, they choose rectal tissue. What they measure, you can see it in, in the left-hand side here, four things that they measure. Tinophia diphosphate, m tricetabine diphosphate, and their competing nucleotides. So uh, the ATP will be the competing nucleotides for TFV, and DCTP, the competing nucleotide for FTC. And all these participants were, were in fact, uh, HIV infected, but uh, virologically suppressed HIV infected adults uh, who were on Truvada containing regimen. And there are three cohorts. Back when they presented it, there were four cisgender women, four transgender women, and two cisgender men. And the collection is all from rectal biopsy. Uh, even for four transgender women in this cohort, we again see the similar pattern in variable hormones regimen, and some use oral estrogen, some use injectable estrogen, some use medroxyprogesterone. So again, uh, emphasizing on a lot of regimens out there that people are using. On the left-hand side, they, they, just, they directly measure the analytes, the concentration. So on the left-hand side, there was no significant differences in the rectal tissue intracellular nucleotide concentration between transgender women and other genders. But on the right-hand side, they find some significant differences, and that is the TFV that is phosphate per the ATP ratio. They found that um, the rectal TFV that is to the ATP ratio was lowered by tenfold among transgender women compared to other genders. So, so what this basically means is that at the rectal tissue of transgender women, they have less active metabolites compared to um, cisgender women, cisgender men. And another two figures, um, looking a little bit more thoroughly, and we see that the TFV diphosphate to the ATP ratio uh, correlates with the concentration of estrogen and progesterone inversely uh, correlated to each other. The conclusion of this study, rectal tenophyl diphosphate to ATP ratio was significantly lowered among transgender women compared to cisgender women and cisgender men. This is the first to confirm in vitro findings and suggesting that feminizing estradiol may impact uh, the prepharmacology. The second study is from Dr. Sher and his team presented by Dr. Hendricks at the HAVR4P uh, HAV in Madrid uh, a couple months back, uh, John Hopskin team. It was, it was, this was an open-label, one-way study enrolling eight HIV cisgender men and eight HIV negative uh, transgender women. So what they did was very unique in that um, they, they, they evaluated the baseline of all these participants, and then they have this um, directly observed dosage of PrEP from day one to day six. So I mean, you can be assured that these, these participants have 100% adherences. And then they check the blood level and the PBMC and the colon biopsy at day seven, day eight. Again, similarly to the study from UNC, eight transgender women, eight feminizing hormone regimens. 
And shown here is the um, pharmacokinetics data. On the left-hand side is plasma tenophobia, and the right-hand side is plasma intracytotabine. So we can see that there is a difference in the concentration throughout the concentration time curve, um, persisting all the way to the trough concentration on both drugs, both TFV and FTC. Now we can see the number here in the lower table. We'll see TOF is the uh, trough concentration. And there is a significant reduction of plasma trough concentration tenophobia by 20%, and that is significant, and plasma trough concentration of FTC of 26%. Again, this is significant. Um, Dr. Hendricks also noted that uh, although these are uh, significant reduction, but for references, because they know that uh, that the, the participants take the meth 100% adherence, these changes will put transgender women in somewhere between the range of four to seven doses per week, which is um, considered all right for the protective effect of PrEP. Now, um, those figures are from plasma. Now we look into the intracellular pharmacokinetics for PBMC, tenophobia disphosphate, and tricytabine disphosphate, uh, we can see some differences, um, but uh, they were not statistically significant. And well, it was point out, pointing out that it could be due to the assay doing in intracellular, um, much, uh, typically much noisier than in plasma. Importantly, but again, it is not statistically significant. Uh, observe the colon cells. The, C, the trough concentration are around 36% reduction for tenophobia and 44% reduction for FTC. So that's a very steep reduction, although it was not significant. The conclusion of uh, this study is that they, we, they observed lower plasma tenophobia, lower plasma intracytabine, and lower active metabolized concentration in colorectal tissue, although it's only statistically significant in the blood among transgender women who were on estrogens. Now I'm going to talk about our study conducted here in the TRC ARC last year. And this is the study to determine the interaction between feminizing hormone therapy and antiretroviral agents used concomitantly among transgender women, or IFACT for short. The objective of this study is to determine drug-drug interactions between feminizing hormone therapy and ARV, and I highlight the word ARV because um, we're going to do both PrEP and ART. Overall, 40 transgender women who were never under, under, underwent orchectomy, and this is because we're going to give them uh, anti-androgen, and had not received injectable feminizing hormone therapy within the six months because we want to make sure that we don't have any noises from the hormone levels, were enrolled from January to November last year, and, and, we, and the, the, the enrollment period was quite long due to the fact that it's quite hard to find a newly HIV infected transgender woman. Again, two groups, two cohorts. Uh, on the left hand side, 20 HIV negative transgender women who we will put on PrEP, and 20 HIV positive transgender women who we will put on ART. On the bottom half is the study scheme, which was brilliantly um, made by one of our biostatisticians, Stephen Kerr. And this is a very well thought out um, A, drug A, to drug A, B, to drug B study scheme. What we did was at enrollment, we give our participants feminizing hormone therapy. At three weeks, we wait for the steady state of the hormone, then we shake the hormone for the first time. At the same visit, after shaking the hormones, we give them ARV, either it's PrEP or whether it's ART. We wait for two weeks for the ARV to reach its steady state, and then we recheck both the hormones and the ARV levels. At the same visit, we stop feminizing hormone therapy, waiting it to be eliminated from the body, which usually takes around three weeks, and recheck the ARV levels again before we um, restart the feminizing hormone therapy, follow up until week 15 for safety purposes. I only have the data for PrEP, which we presented in the AIDS conference at Amsterdam last year. So again, 20 HIV negative transgender women were enrolled, and the feminizing hormone therapy, this is unique for our studies, that we, we control these hormones. We want them to use the same hormone, and that is estradiol valerate 2 milligrams per day, 
plus ciprotylone acetate, or CPA for short, 25 milligrams per day. The reason to it is because these re this regimen is quite commonly used among Thai population. And regarding the dosage, I would say this is kind of like the, the middle range, not too high, not too low. Again, the study scheme is the same. Now for our results, it's two parts of it. The first part is between the mashup between week three and week five. So the purpose of this mashup is to see whether PrEP has any effect on the hormones. You can see here our result. Um, Look a little bit weird to see max, but it's actually not statistically significant. At the bottom half, you see the table, all these PK parameters, and we found that it's a negative finding. We, don't, we, don't, we did not find any um, significant reduction or significant increase regarding these hormones, whether it's AUC, C max, C, um, C24, or Half-Life. This is a, a good negative finding, so we can then ensure that PrEP will not affect your hormones, your feminizing hormone therapy level. But always bear in mind that we control the hormones. The second half of our analysis is week five against week eight. And the purpose of this matchup is to see whether feminizing hormone therapy has any effect on PrEP. Unfortunately, we, find, we found a very similar data in that hormones decrease um, tenophobia level. So the significant finding that we found was AUC and C24. We found that in the presence of feminizing hormone therapy, the plasma tenophobia reduced by 12%, uh, by 12%, excuse me, and for uh, C24, it was reduced by 18%, and these two parameters are significantly reduced. The conclusion of our studies, Lower plasma tenophobia exposure and concentration in the presence of feminizing hormone therapy and estrogen was not, was not significantly affected by PrEP, so that's just news. So in summary of all these three studies, uh, which just presented last year, among transgender women, we found some similar trend in the decrease in the reduction of tenophobia level some unique feature of, of some of the studies. So plasma trough concentration tenophobia significantly reduced by 18 to 20 percent. Plasma trough concentration M3 to be significantly reduced by 26 percent. Um, uh, for the target tissue, medial rectal, TFV that is forfeit, per the ATP ratio is competing nucleotides, was lower by tenfold among transgender women. Colon cells, although not statistically significant, it still should be noted that uh, there's a steep reduction in the active form of both tenophobia and FTC. And last but not least, some good news. Um, plasma estradiol exposure was not significantly affected by PrEP. And again, all these data, 2018, we're just starting scratching the surface of this topic. And there are still many unanswered questions that we need to look forward into. For, for instance, different feminizing hormone regimen. I have been raving on since the IPREX that all these studies, um, even just a few amount of transgender population, they have various um, hormone regimens and how are we gonna solve that problem. And number two, we got the number now, 18, 20%, 26%, but these number, are they really clinical significant um, re uh, regarding the protective effect of PrEP? So we still don't know that for sure. Um, still need, there still need to be research moving forward. And that ends my majority of my talk, and that's the transgender woman, feminizing hormone therapy, interaction to ARV. Next, I'm going to talk about the masculinizing hormone therapy interaction with, with ARV. And I'm really sorry to disappoint you because there are no data regarding transgender movement. We found error here when we search Google. So, well, I don't want to leave you guys hanging, but let, let's just see what we know so far. So, first of all, the concern over transgender men comes from the fact that the sexual network overlaps with vulnerable population. And here's kind of like a, a shot to summarize around it. 21% transgender men, 10% transgender women, 24% cisgender men. How about the numbers? Zero to three percent is the HIV prevalence among transgender men. And I really need, need to straight away emphasize that these are the numbers from only a couple of studies, like three to four studies. 
And the highest number of participants in one of the study is roughly around 12, 200 people. So the confident interval is very, very wide. A lot more information is needed, hopefully with larger sample size, to make certain that this number is correct or not. Otherwise, we're gonna be, it's going to be a false low. And lastly, 35% uh, has been reported to use injectable testosterone. Um, this number is quite, well, it's considered very low compared to transgender women. Uh, a recent survey in Thailand, definitely more than 50% of transgender women used feminizing hormone therapy. A recent survey from the US, I believe it's NYC, said it's up to 75%. But I think there's some explanation into it. I mentioned to you all earlier that testosterone is not recommended for oral form. So injectable, uh, let's say, is the way to go. So it's going to be hard to access it. You, you cannot buy it by yourself over the counter. You need to get a uh, doctor prescription. The price is also more expensive. How about the concerns? The same thing still applies to transgender men, and that is drug, drug interaction. But unique thing, unique thing here is that we cannot forget about the concerns over pregnancy. I mean, we, we work so much with MSM, we work so much with transgender women, sometimes we tend to forget this thing. Transgender men usually don't want to get pregnant, and they are concerned that taking PrEP and hormones sometimes might reduce the effect of testosterone, and they might still have the, um, kind of like the, the characteristics of, of cisgender women. So, in conclusion for my talk, um, concerns over drug-drug interaction between DHT and ARVs is very important. It can hamper the uptake, it can hamper the adherence of ARV, not just PrEP, but ART as well, among transgender women, a uh, transgender population, excuse me. And that could lead to a, a challenging task in eradicating HIV in this population. Regarding the data for feminizing hormone therapy and PrEP, uh, we found that feminizing hormone therapy significantly decreased um, plasma, tenofovir, FTC levels. Good news again is that plasma estradiol level is not significantly affected by PrEP. For FHT and ART, we have no data yet, unfortunately, but uh, we as a team here at TRCAC are expecting to provide you some of the results, the result from the second half of our IFAC study, hopefully in Mexico this year. And lastly, transgender women data is greatly lacking. We are trying to, to get some of the data right now, but, but it's still uh, a way to go. Last but not least, um, just a few acknowledgements. Uh, without this group of people, this topic would never made it here to the Bangkok Symposium. Such a new topic and often overlooked topic. Um, Professor Bapan and Dr. Nitya Panupak are two of the um, greatest mentor a young physician like myself can ask for. And I have a great team, Rina, V, uh, Lee, Kanita, uh, integral part to our IFAC study and really move us towards this uh, territory of drug drug interaction, other staff as well. And most importantly, thank you to all the participants who volunteered themselves to be in, our, in these studies, giving us the chance to provide uh, information back to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Akarin. Any questions? So, I have one question for you. Um, I was just thinking about, um, you said that transgender women had lower tenofovir levels when they're using feminizing hormones, right? Are there any studies on cisgender women on contraception, which is this essentially the same thing that they're using for uh, uh, female uh, for transitioning, and also on PrEP, and what's the efficacy? Did the PrEP, did the tenofovir level also decrease in transgender women who are on um, hormone therapy? Okay. Uh, uh, for for the first question regarding cisgender women data, uh, regarding hormones, again, the hormones for the cisgender women study were usually based on the, the outcome of um, what do you contraception. Yeah. So there, it was a negative finding. There was no effect towards the pregnancy outcome. So that means that PrEP doesn't have 
but let's just say it doesn't have significant effect towards the hormones used among cisgender women, and vice versa as well. There are studies suggesting that using hormone doesn't really affect the, the, uh, the contraceptive hormone, doesn't really affect the efficacy of PrEP. But again, I, I need to emphasize that there might be differences because the, the, the doses of hormone uh, are definitely different, different between um, transgender women and cisgender women. And I'm sorry, the other question is regarding trans. So if you have like, a, if you're using a cisgender woman using PrEP and on hormone, would there then off of your levels also go down. Would the effect of PrEP on them would be lower? Would their levels oh, be Oh, okay, lower? I understand. So uh, I, I haven't seen that data yet regarding pharmacokinetic outcomes. Yeah, so, so that would be my answer. I, I'm not, I, I don't know about that yet right now regarding system. I was thinking it could be something that you could look yeah, at. I agree with that. In terms of efficacy of PrEP. And then I think I'm just interested, is you said that the IFAC study, you don't know yet what's the significance of the finding. And I was just wondering if you're going to continue to look at that. Yeah, that's an excellent question <laughs> right there. Um, we, we're really looking forward to do it, but it's going to be tough because when we, 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 we think about it, so if, if we're going to do it, it's going to be clinical trials. It's going to require a lot of sample size. Mm -hmm. Just even 20 participants, it's very hard to find for us right now. Even if UNC, they can enroll in one year, they only got four, uh, four, four participants. So, I would say it's something we're looking forward to do because it's going to mean so much to the communities. But finger crossed if we can can really do it, make it happen. Um, but anyhow, I, I think you raised a very uh, very important point here. So, the twelve percent uh, reduction exposure um, for prep concentration uh, when in the presence of um, hormone therapy. The the key I, I would go back to what Dr. Hendricks mentioned in, in John Hopkins study is that. We still found that if you have good adherences to PrEP, you have 100% adherence to PrEP, the drug level will not decrease to, to, to lower than four pills per day, and that's the goal. So if you still have the drug concentration of more or equal to four pills per day, the efficacy of PrEP should still be there, and it is what we're looking for. So I would say that the clinical application, first of all, the good news is that we can get rid of the concern that many transgender women had in that it will not affect your hormones. But again, for, don't forget that we need to uh, use an optimal um, hormone label as well. And for regarding the hormone effect to PrEP, advice, daily PrEP, good adherences, and don't forget other things. Practice safe, safe condom use is still there. I, I think it's the way to go because at least we can el uh, eliminate uh, the major concerns for transgender population. Okay, I think that's a very good take home message for our patients who are all transgender women who are, who are on hormones and on zone prep. Um, that's it for this afternoon. Um, I'll see you all tomorrow and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much.